Also on Sunday mornings, we're going through the book of Romans, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and today we'll be in verse 23 and 24 in chapter 3. So if you could please turn there, Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 24 today. Uh, actually, for the sake of context, I'll begin back in verse 21 and read through to verse 24. Once you find your way there, if you're able, if not, that's okay. I'll have you stand so you can follow along with me as I read the text. The Apostle Paul is writing by the Holy Spirit, and back in verse 21 says, But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference. Verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified free by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Ask God's blessing on our study of His Word. Father, focus our attention. Enable us by the Holy Spirit to understand that which we have set before us in your word this morning. Lord, we need for the Holy Spirit to build this into our lives, to give us understanding for our lives. Lord, we humbly admit that if we try in and of ourselves we will fail, and we labor in vain. So, Lord, you need to teach us and minister to us. We give you permission. So, Lord, speak. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. This is part two of a series titled God-Centered Solutions to Man-Centered Problems. The Apostle Paul has been rising from the pages of this chapter, and he's been teaching to us how that it's not all about us. I know that's sort of elementary, but I like how one commentator said it. The big danger in preaching this passage is that we treat it as if it were about us when it's about God. It is not centrally about me. This God-centeredness is a problem for preachers, for we think people will pay more attention if the message is centered on human beings. Many a pastor will craft their message, tailor fit their sermon to what he thinks the people want to hear. He wants to, if you will, scratch where they're itching. And you see it manifested with topical teaching titles like the top ten reasons, as if to adopt from David Letterman his list of ten. We talked about this on Thursday night. The Israelites were not to have any association in their worship of God with the altars or the images of the Canaanite gods. In other words, pastor, me, I don't need to borrow from the world to tailor fit the sermon and center it around you. It's not about you. It is about God And this is what the Apostle Paul is doing. In a sense, he's reshifting their focus. He's reshifting our focus away from this man-centeredness to a God-centeredness. And actually, that's the problem. Man-centered problems are problems because they're man-centered. And that's why... There's no solutions to the problems because we're looking for man-centered solutions for our man-centered problems, and the problem is, that's the problem. I'll try to <laughs> say that in a way that's maybe a little bit easier to get your mind around. 
If we're wondering why it is that there's such peril in the church today, perhaps we need look no further than to what's preached in the church today. There's no victory in our life, and there's no solutions to the problems of our life when all we ever hear are how-to sermons on success for our life. I, I was thinking about this prior to teaching on this, and even, you know, reflected on some of the titles I've chosen for our expositional teaching on Sunday mornings. And really, Thursday nights don't have titles, but still, it's an expositional teaching. And I'm always careful and prayerful about titling the teaching something like Seven Keys, you know, Seven Promises, Seven Habits, Ten This, Eight That. Listen, the problem is, I can't keep Ten Commandments. What in the world? And even three points sometimes. <laughs> you know, and bless your hearts, you poor people. Bless, you have treasures in heaven, you know. I, th I hope you know that. Sitting through my long sermons, and I watch you furiously and hopelessly taking notes, you know. Okay, point one, I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to do this. No. <laughs> Don't do that. The problems get even worse when, not if, we fail after trying to keep the seven promises or develop the seven habits of highly effective people. Nothing inherently wrong with those things. What's wrong with those things is when we say, if I do those things, then God will do this. It's formula Christianity. It's insert tab A into slot B Christianity. And we think in our humanity that if I do A, B, C, then God will do D, E, F. I don't think that I have to tell you. I'm sure you can recall in your own Christian experience how many times God has done something that has just totally and absolutely blown your mind. Now, here we're expecting God to come in through this door. We've been praying, laboring in prayer. Oh, God, you know. And God says, you know what? I'm God. You're not. I don't want to come in through that door. I'd like to come in through the window. Would that be all right with you? Because my ways are not your ways. See, we think that we think how God thinks. You think? <laughs> your thoughts are not his thoughts. Isaiah reminds us of that. And besides that, if you think that you think how God thinks, then God's not God. I mean, perish the thought, pun intended, that God thinks how I think. We're all in deep kimchi, if he did. This brand of Christianity cannot work because the seed of its success was planted in the infertile soil of man-centeredness. It cannot grow, and it will not grow. And this is why a lot of Christians won't go and grow, because they're already set up for failure. About Tuesday of that week, they'll try to apply Sunday's keys, points. You know, I'm going to do A, B, C. Then about Tuesday, they fail miserably, throw up their hands in defeat, and realize, I can't do this. To which I imagine God in heaven saying, well, it's about time you realize that you can't do this. Can I do it now? I, I, can I just be God now? I know this is impossible, God. I know. Now that it's impossible for you, it's possible for me. But see, when it was still possible for you, it was impossible for me. It was hands off to me. You did not give me permission to be God in your life because you were trying to figure it out, work it out in the energy of your own strength. That's man-centered Christianity. And it is a recipe for failure in our Christian experience. You'll never make it. And this is really why I believe it is that so many Christians live such defeated lives. And this is the reason the beloved apostle writes this in this his epistle this way. It's not chiefly about me and my salvation. It's about God and his justification. 
See, the problem of our salvation comes vis-a-vis the solution of God's justification. Absent this, the divine dilemma of man's sin has no solution. And as long as I insist and persist in trying to solve my problems my way, there's no way. And I can't sing, I did it my way. Really? You did it your way? And so I'll boast about it and I'll take all the glory for it and we'll see that at the conclusion of chapter 3 where this is all going, where Paul's taken this. Now we saw the first way in part 1 where in verse 21, Paul unveils the how of the God-centered solution to the what of the man-centered problem. It comes from God apart from the law. In verse 21, Paul says that now a righteousness from God apart from the law testified to by both the prophets and the law has now been made known. We have the righteousness revealed, whereas heretofore we had had the wrath of God revealed. See, if it were under the law and not apart from the law, then there can be no salvation because according to the law, I receive only condemnation. That's why when we get to chapter 8, verse 1, Paul will say there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Not because of the law, but apart from the law. And it comes not from me, from God. It's not about me, it's about him. See, we have taken even our salvation and made it about us. I'm saved. And we've taken it to the degree in which we can say in our hearts, I'm more saved than you. Second one comes through faith to those who believe. He says, verse 22, that this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. It's not through self-righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness. If it were, then instead of a righteousness from God through faith apart from the law, I could in my self-righteousness apart from God keep the law or try to, under the law, earn that righteousness, that right standing with God. Now, this is all going to fit ever so beautifully with our third one we see in verses 23 and 24. God-centered solutions to man-centered problems come by grace for all have sinned. In verse 23, Paul says that, and we use this verse when we're evangelizing, don't we? We all have it memorized. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And he says this is why there's no difference between the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews are no better than the Gentiles. And then in verse 24, he explains how it is that we're all justified freely by his grace through the redemption that only came by Christ Jesus. Now, I'm keenly aware that what I'm about to say will be deemed a firm grasp of the obvious. But here it is. All our problems are because all are sinners. Let me say it again. All our problems are because we're all sinners. That's the problem. We've all sinned. Why do I have problems in the marriage? It's because there are sinners in the marriage. You want a problem-free marriage? You need a people-free marriage. (laughs) Think about that. I was uh, sharing with a brother a couple weeks ago after second service, and you know, he's a, a businessman and has a practice here in the community. And we were talking about business, you know, because I still at heart am a businessman. I've owned and operated businesses and, 
And we were just talking about, you know, I was like, hey, how's the economy affected the business? How you doing? You know, how's business? And, and he said, you know, just, and he started, you know, kind of lamenting a little bit. That, that's a spiritual way to say complaining, and it's okay if you're lamenting. <laughs> Complaining's not God, you know, smote the Israelites when they complained, but lamenting's different. It, it, it's sanctified, so we're lamenting. And it was kind of interesting because, you know, the problems just internally, the communication problems, and I was just kind of joking with him, saying to him that if you want a problem-free business, you need a people-free business. You want a problem-free church? A people-free church. That's the answer. Why? Because all are sinners. This is what I love about when I do weddings, and I always have the pre-marriage you know, uh, mentoring and you know, Bible studies that I take the you know, precious young couple through, and if they can make it through. Some don't survive, but anyway, <laughs> if they, you know, survive, then, you know, of course, I perform their wedding ceremony, and I always want to communicate to them how important it is that they never look at their marriage through these rose-colored glasses of perfection. Because I'm telling you, man, after that wedding comes the marriage. And when, <laughs> when you wake up the next morning, you look over at that guy or that gal, you're going to realize they are a sinner. <laughs> There's no such thing as a perfect marriage. You cannot have a perfect marriage because there are sinners in that marriage. I think about parenting. I look at my children. I look at my four-year-old daughter as adorable as she is. And the problem is, she's a sinner. She doesn't look like one, but she is, trust me. <laughs> now, <laughs> the problem in man-centered Christianity is that I'll see it as a man-centered problem, a marriage problem. I'm having financial problems. I'm having marriage problems. I'm having problems in my parenting with my children. And you fill in the blank. But it's not a marriage problem. It's a sin problem. And the only answer to this sin problem for man is the grace solution from God. I am justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that comes by Jesus Christ. And that's why it's not supremely about my salvation. It's about his justification. Now, Paul's going to introduce us to some pretty big words here, some seminary words here. And I want to try to give a better understanding of what they mean, starting with the word justification. It's really best defined as a legal term as it relates to the court of law. It's a paid in full for the debt of that crime. Now, here's an illustration. I suppose that one of my sons hacks into my account and makes exorbitant purchases online. I would, um, of course, beat him mercilessly and ground him for the rest of his life. But after that, <laughs> the reality is, I'm just kidding, by the way, okay, just sort of. But anyway, um, <laughs> on the grounding part, that, that would happen. Uh, anyway, enough of my problems. <laughs> They're man-centered problems. Anyway, he's committed a crime. He's broken the law. Now, when the statement arrives, we've got a problem. Here's this enormous amount of debt that is now owed, and he can't pay it. Now, because of my grace, he is justified freely when I pay his debt in full, and I don't require him to pay me back. And then he could say, it's just if I'd never done it. That's what that means. We have sinned. We have broken God's law, which is why it has to be apart from the law. But because of his grace, by his grace, it's just if I'd never sinned. It's just if, as if he never did it. He's 
justified. Now it gets better. As one so aptly put it, God writes the check of redemption to pay the price of propitiation. Told you there were going to be some big words in there. Now, that's why there's justification for my salvation. This is the God-centered solution of salvation by way of justification. It's by the grace of God through the redemption of Jesus Christ. Okay, let's try to get our hands on this justification, redemption, propitiation, all of the above. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try to explain them in the context of my son who's now grounded for life. <laughs> My son's justification, were he still under the obligation by law to pay as he would have been in Paul's day, he'd have been sold into slavery because of the debts. You have to understand that in Rome at this time, when this epistle was received by the Romans from Paul, there were approximately six million slaves in the Roman Empire many of whom had been sold on the auction block as slaves because of their debts that they couldn't pay. Now, we don't do that today. We just file bankruptcy and go out and buy a new car. I wish I were joking. It's not true. I mean, that is, that is true, you know. I mean, they, they tried, don't get me started on this. I'll, I could preach a whole sermon on that, and I won't. I could, but I won't. I want to, but I, I won't. So, in this case, I redeem him. You know how when you go redeem at the recycling center? That, that, it, they call it the redemption center. That, that's what the term means. I'm going to redeem him by paying for him, by buying him so that he's freed from the slave market. Now, I've paid the debt for his salvation at the cost of his redemption. Okay, now what about this word propitiation? Well, that's how God solves man's sin problem. God's wrath is now appeased. It's been appeased because of the justification, the redemption. So now there's propitiation, which basically means God is appeased. He's been satisfied. The debt has been paid. His wrath has been appeased. Redemption has been accomplished. Justification has been accomplished. And, and by the way, don't be too quick to dismiss justification. Just think about the Casey Anthony trial. That's not justice. Because still, there's a little girl that was murdered, and nobody has been, uh, you know, the one who's been acknowledged as, as committing the crime. It's an unsolved crime. And even if there was no jury and the judge just said, you know what, I'm just going to, you know, let you go. That's not justice. And that's not justification. There's no justification. There's no redemption. There's none of that. I'm not going to get into all of that because, my goodness, for the last how many months, uh, that was just in front of our face as, as grievous as it was. See, the judge's wrath has been appeased. That's propitiation. By virtue of how the debt that was owed has been paid for in full by another. God's wrath was satisfied by Christ's sacrifice of atonement. That's the propitiation, the substitute, you see. And we'll see this with our fifth God-centered solution in the next verse next week, Lord willing. I want to close with a question. And I ask it of myself, too. Since God did all of this for our salvation eternally, 
Will he not also take care of us in this world temporally? I don't know what problems you brought with you to church today. And please don't misunderstand my heart. I in no way want to, you know, make light of the seriousness of the trials that you face in your life. But I want to encourage you that if our God would do this for our justification, keeping the law intact apart from the law, remaining just, remaining loving, both at the same time, if God is going to provide a way for my redemption, free me from the slavery of sin, and give to me the free gift of eternal life, and I'm trusting him when that trumpet does sound to take me out of here, and in the twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up, raptured up, to meet the Lord and be with him in the air, and we'll see all of those loved ones that died in Christ prior. I'm going to see my daughter. I'm going to see my mommy. I'm going to see my dad, I hope, who, by the way, on this day, August 14th of 1994, suffered a massive heart attack and died. I thought about that this morning. I'm trusting God for all of that. And I can't trust him to take care of the problems I'm having in this life, problems paying the bills. I, I can trust him to transform in a metamorphosis this body and give me a new body. I can't wait. Thank you, Jesus. In the twinkling of an eye. And I can't trust him for this month's rent. The car broke, breaks down and the bill is two, three hundred dollars, and it's two, three hundred dollars I don't have. It might as well be two or three thousand dollars. Is, isn't God going to take care of me? Hey, He's got a lot invested in you. Remember, you're bought with a price, He paid for you. He bought you. Listen, as a former car dealer, I say that affectionately. Don't stone me to death yet. I would buy cars at the auction. And that was how I invested in my inventory that I would then sell for a profit. And when I bought the inventory, I would take care of that inventory, and I would make sure that nobody would ding the doors because that's my investment. So I'd park it like this, you know, in the parking lot and at an angle, and, and then they would key it, key the side, and, <laughs> and then I was free, because then I didn't have to worry anymore, because now it's, anyway, again, enough of my problems. But isn't God going to take care of that? Psalm 55, 22, cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, the apostle Peter echoes this. He says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Let me, let me ask this question. If salvation eternally comes from God by grace through faith, then will not the cares of this life come from God by grace through faith? If salvation, if it's for by grace we are saved through faith, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If that's the template for the eternal problem of man's damnation and condemnation, then doesn't it just stand to reason that that's also the solution to our problems now? In Matthew chapter 6, and we'll close with this, 
Jesus, this is one of my, in fact, this passage, I'll just, I'll just be candid with you. This Sermon on the Mount, or as I like to call it, the Sermon on the Amount, uh, has for me been perhaps one of the most profound, life-changing truths in all of my life. Really, it begins in verse 19. I want to encourage you. I think I mentioned this last week for all of you who are worriers, chronic worriers, you're worryaholics. You really need to let Matthew 6, 19 through 34 minister to your life. Jesus says, beginning in verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. And by the way, I never imagine when Jesus says, oh, you of little faith, I never imagine him being angry like, oh, you of little faith. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no way. It was more of a, I believe, because it's the heart of God. Oh, you, why did you doubt? Your faith is so little. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now listen. Jesus is saying, do you realize how valuable you are in the eyes of God? Do you know the value that your Father in heaven has placed on you? You are an invaluable investment. You are so valuable that it cost him his own life to redeem you. His shed blood to pay in full for you. That's how much he loves you. So give your cares to him. Give your worries to him. Take those cares and turn them into prayers and let God be God in your life. And I can promise you on the authority of God's word that if you'll do that and give him permission to be that, those problems that you brought to church with you today, with almost a stroke of the pen, God can take care of it like that. Sometimes I wonder if he's not just waiting for us to come to him. So why won't you come to me? It comes from me. Why, why don't you come to me? You think the solution to this problem comes from you, yourself? It comes from me. And it doesn't come by striving. It comes by grace. That unmerited favor. I'm going to give you what you don't deserve apart from the law because what you do deserve under the law is condemnation and damnation. But I've taken care of that. I've paid for that. I've justified that. I've redeemed that. So stop that. Let me be God. You know, in my life, I've been walking with the Lord for... I can't even do the math in my head right now. 82, whatever you want to do, do the math. 80, 1982 to 2011. Um, I was five, so I'm not that old. But uh, anyway, that's when I came to Christ. And here's the thing I'm learning, and I have the scars to prove it, that there have been times in my life where I needlessly suffered for an elongated period of time, all because I would not come to him, knowing that it would come from him, by his grace and through faith. If you want three points, that's it. I just gave it to you. 
from him by grace through faith. If that's how our salvation comes, the solution to the eternal sin problem, then so too, that's how the solution to your problem here today comes. Why don't you all stand? Father in heaven, we're... Maybe a little bit disenfranchised right about now just because I believe your Holy Spirit has really spoken today. That the clarion call is to come back to you. To trust in you. Even to recommit to you. Lord, will you forgive us for making it all about us? Will you forgive us for centering everything on us? Lord, will you enable us and empower us by the Holy Spirit to reshift that upon you, casting upon you all of our cares, knowing that you care for us, that you have so much invested in us because of your love for us. Lord, forgive us. Lord, thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.